Greetings to our St. Michael's online community, wherever you are. Our New Testament reading this week that is set in the lectionary is taken from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verse 6 to 19. In this letter, it seems as if Paul preaches today's sermon on my behalf. Paul's message to Timothy reinforces what could be one of the lessons of Jesus' parable about the rich man and the poor beggar named Lazarus. The letter includes one of the most well-known and most quoted pieces of scripture, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. From our New Testament reading, verse 6 to 10, could describe this rich man from Jesus' parable. Timothy wrote, I mean, Paul wrote to Timothy, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The rich man is indeed content with his wealth, his feasting, and his possessions, until he finds himself in Hades, having wandered from the faith and pierced with many griefs. He is happy on earth until the time comes for his life to end. That is when he learns how true it is that we brought nothing into the world and can take nothing out of it. Aware of his foolish and harmful desires, he begs, that Lazarus could go and warn his family so that they don't follow in his indulgent and destructive ways. Scholars have warned us not to take this parable as a literal depiction of the afterlife scenario or of personal salvation. The parable has many elements to signal to us that it is a story that fits common patterns even recognizable to us in stories today. For example, the extreme contrast between the rich and the poor that creates an expectation for how the story will unfold. The story also includes recognizable characters such as Father Abraham and the name Lazarus, which is not the name of Jesus' dear friend in this story, but chosen because the name means God has helped. The fact that there is a reference to Hades is an element taken from Greek culture and mythology. Even that extreme role reversal of the rich man being brought low and Lazarus seated with Abraham and the angels is a storytelling technique that would have been familiar to the audience of that day and of today parable or no. This story is therefore not a textbook description. It's not a reliable or factual account of the afterlife experience. To treat it like that might be to perhaps take cooking advice and recipes from the three witches in the play for, of Macbeth. It doesn't, it doesn't suit the purpose. While there is certainly a warning about the temptations that come with wealth, making us self-indulgent and self-reliant, the rich man is not in Hades because he was rich. The thing is that he knew better. The teachings of Moses and the prophets were there for him all along, and they are there for us. He had been lured away from what Paul calls the godliness of contentment, the basics of faith, love, and gentleness that had always been the standard. In the extract from the letter to Timothy, we read, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, 
which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This was Paul's advice to Timothy to pass on to the church at Ephesus, and here he is passing it on to us today. And here lies the conclusion and the point where Paul's sermon and my sermon diverge. Paul writes of a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. As Paul points to the life of the coming age, I want to suggest that it's not just that time after our death when we are compensated for our suffering on earth or punished for our wrongdoing. We can take hold of the life that is truly life by proclaiming God's kingdom in the world through word and action in this present day. The coming age is indeed the always arriving day of the Lord that bursts in wherever and whenever we become the good news. The theologian Bruce Eppley calls this parable a wake-up call, a challenge to see if our personal lives and politics and economics create greater or lesser separation between the rich and poor and between insiders and outsiders. That great chasm that cannot be crossed, the one referenced in the parable, is one of our own making. For Eppoli, the tragedy of the parable is that the wealthy person has the resources to uplift the person literally on his doorstep, but was desensitized and uncaring. His failure or refusal to see and hear or to empathize created a gulf in this life that echoed into eternity. There is a price to pay when we neglect others because of our apathy or our complacence. Fear of eternal damnation is an equally selfish reason to heed the call of Moses, the prophets, and of Christ who rose from death. That is what Jesus illustrates in this parable. The price is alienation from God's highest call for our lives. The invitation here and now to take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen. Amen.